All right, am I live? Let's see here. It looks like I'm live. Um, if you can see me, go ahead and uh, comment that you can see me. Let's go Command-2, okay, right there. Command-2. All right, so I got a thumbs up. All right, awesome. Let's go here. Command two, come on. All right, I'm having a little technical difficulties. Okay, I think I got it. All right, perfect, can you hear me? All right. All right, perfect. All right, I'm gonna give everybody a minute to hop on. Uh, I've spoken to a few of you via text or email and uh, you shared some of the stuff that you're looking forward to hearing. So I, I am excited to talk to you about this all. So um, if you haven't spoken with me, though, let me know what is your number one thing that you want to take away from this. I want to make sure that I try to at least discuss or highlight uh, a lot of what you all want to hear about. ADHD, autism, uh, were probably the two most common ones, along with uh, emotional regulation issues was probably the third. And so... If there's something that y'all want to uh, hear more about or if I can emphasize, please let me know. I'm going to give everybody just a second to jump on. And let's see here. I'm just peeking on my phone. So am I live here? Let's see what this looks like. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. I got seven people on. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's get started. Uh, so, unraveling neural developmental disorders and behaviors. There's a lot that goes into this, okay? Uh, and you can see kind of on the bottom, there's a just a plethora of diagnoses that go under this neural developmental disorders slash behaviors diagnosis. ADHD, sensory processing, OCD, dyslexia, uh, autism. So there's a lot. Uh, it's commonly kind of referred to as uh, alphabet soup. And so, um, there is a lot of commonality among these diagnoses. And so um, there's a lot that we need to look at with these kiddos. So, all right, one more second. Hold on, I had one more person just text me asking me how to get in. So let's do this real quick. Send them. How, did you all get an email from me? I sent out a couple emails with uh, the link to the group. Did you get those? Go ahead and comment. Okay. Hopefully they'll be able to get in. All right, let's go. Let's let's just start going. All right, so uh, I'm Dr. Brian Asby, and you know when I got into chiropractic, I'll be honest, I was kind of a little bit afraid of working with kids, and so you know it was it was not my passion; it was my wife's passion, and so. It wasn't until we had our son and I started working with a lot more kids that I really, uh, my passion started growing. And so uh, it, my son was born uh, almost four years ago now and he had the cord wrapped around his neck. And uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, it was about an hour for my wife to push, which in the grand scheme of, of things wasn't you know, terribly long. But I was standing there as a dad watching him kind of, you know, being trying to get out of the birth canal, right, with this cord wrapped around his neck. And so I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit stressed out, right, first time dad. And uh, like in my brain, like I wanted to go in and grab him, right, and, and, and pull him out. And like there was this the instinct to get to him and try to save him. But that wasn't how this was going to work, right? I had to kind of sit there. And so you know, in my mind as I'm watching this, and I'm observing this, I'm like, oh, oh no, well, you know, what do I do? Um, how do I, how do I help him, right? And so um, it just was, it was scary, okay? And it was a lot for me to take in as a, as a parent. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm like, oh no, I have to start, you know, I have to treat him, right? Like I, my mind is like, how do I adjust him? What do I do? All of this stuff is going on in my brain. And it was at that moment that I was like, I just need to know more. And so like, again, my wife had a, a strong passion for pediatric care. So she had already started seeing 
uh, a lot of kiddos and she was helping them with neurodevelopmental stuff. And we were seeing, you know, she's seeing all these crazy changes and then I have my son. And so about four years ago, I completely flipped uh, what I was doing. I, I had a large focus on like chronic pain and like sports medicine and stuff like that. And so I've switched completely to, you know, neurodevelopmental stuff. And so my passion is for these kids because, you know, I enjoy helping others with, you know, chronic pain and stuff like that. But there is something absolutely phenomenal and, 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 and awesome about changing a kid's trajectory. And so that's where all my focus has been. Um, all of my training over the past uh, four years has been dedicated to that and it's specifically on neural developmental uh, and brain development. And if you focus on brain development, it is immensely helpful because you can, you can find where these kiddos are in their developmental spectrum age and help them with what they're encountering. And so what I mean by that is, you know, you have a lot of eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds, 13 year olds, uh, and they're chronologically that age, meaning they are 13 years old, right? They just had, I just have a, I just started seeing a 13 year old with ADHD, but developmentally, they're not that age. And this is where I see the most discouragement, the most misunderstanding among health professionals, uh, among teachers and other things. And it's just an education thing. We just have to understand where these kids are. Uh, because as a 13 year old, if you process your world through the lens of a two or three year old, as far as developmentally, you're gonna act like a two or three year old, okay? And so that is where my focus has been, is understanding where they are developmentally because that's what best helps me serve them whether it means me seeing them or me referring out, understanding them developmentally is the key. Uh, so let me ask you, um, where, what have you all tried? Have you tried anything? Have you tried medication, OT, PT? Have you tried other things? Go ahead and comment. Let me see what you all have tried. And uh, I just want to know. And there's one other person trying to get in the group. So I'm going to allow them in real quick. All right. All right. What have you all tried? OTs. Probably the most common one. Uh, there are some PTs out there. Uh, medications fairly common. Um, mental health professionals can be common if they're, especially if they're a little bit older. What have you all tried? Okay, you know, don't have to comment either. But please do. I want to know more. It helps me understand where people are at. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about how I view the world. <clears throat> So there's two models of health, essentially. There are, there's the pathogenic model. There may be a delay in the comments, so I apologize if it comes through, if I've already started and you've started coming. Uh, there's the pathogenic model, which means I've been diagnosed with something and we're going to work on that something, <clears throat> the disease process, right? That's where medicine is essentially come in, right? You have, you know, COVID or whatever else is going on in the world, right? And so they're looking at that and, and, and trying to intervene in that aspect. Then there's <clears throat> my world, which is called the salutogenic model. Actually, that's a uh, misspell there, so I apologize. But the salutogenic model is, <clears throat> it doesn't really care about diagnosis. What it cares about is function. Function, function, function. How do I, how am I functioning and developing in my world? And so when I see these kiddos, I don't see a diagnosis. I see where are they developmentally? So are they stuck with, you know, are they stuck in movement touch? Are they stuck in auditory? Are they stuck in visual? Are they stuck with primitive reflexes? I'm going to go into all that, so don't, don't get into that. I have one slide that's going to be a, a lot of meat and potatoes for you all, so I hope you uh, are able to watch it. It'll be up in a few seconds here. But um, look, you have to understand where they are. And if you don't understand where they are, um, then it, it, it can be a very frustrating world for them and for you. Uh, so, uh, let's see, hold on. Because of the way they were born, try medication, therapy, pro okay. Lots of stuff. Okay, awesome. I'll, I'll jump into some of that stuff. If you have questions about that stuff, please, um, please ask. Okay, so a salutogenic model kind of follows this. What does the healing? Uh, so what heals the cut, the band-aid, the antibiotic, or the body? 
the, the Band-Aid and the antibiotic can help, right? They can assist, but the body really does the healing. And <clears throat> so what heals the broken finger? This is kind of a, a funny story that I like telling uh, just because it, it's just part of my history. And so um, when I was growing up, so I was homeschooled all 12 years, right? I spent every possible minute playing basketball. And I'm, I'm from Wisconsin, okay? So I'm talking December, maybe it's snow, but it's a sunny day and it's 30 degrees out. I'm shoveling the basketball court and, and playing half court by myself. I mean, I love basketball. Um, and, you know, with everything being shut down, I'm starting to watch all the, the all-star games, Kobe and Jordan, Last Dance, all the fun stuff. But in playing basketball, I jammed my fingers multiple times. I remember them being fat, swollen sausages, just huge. My mom's a nurse, so um, never once did she take me to an urgent care, to the to my uh, pediatrician or anything. She said, you know, it moves and there's no bone sticking out. You're okay. Well, fast forward, uh, I'm at chiropractic college. I'm in my last year and we're playing flag football, you know, kind of getting out exercising. And I jam my fingers into uh, one of the opposing players going for the flag. It pops, it hurts, it's swollen. It's just like every other jam fingers that I've had, you know, back in uh, elementary school, high school, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> and my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, so they've been swollen for two weeks at this time. She's like, you broke your fingers, Brian. Go, you know, get x-ray, we're here. It's, you know, so one of my friends needs some x-ray credits. They're still swollen after two weeks, you know, very valid reason to x-ray my hands. And, and uh, so they get x-rayed, they're broken. And uh, what's called an involution fracture where the bone was ripped away uh, from the, by the tendon. And so <clears throat> I say all this to say, look, I go into the x-ray uh, room with all the, with the radiologist and everything. He's like, whose hand is this? I raised my hand. I said, this is my hand. He said, dude, how many times have you broken your hand or your fingers? And I said, I've never once broken my fingers. And he said, you have multiple breaks <laughs> along all your fingers. And uh, come to find out, you know, all those times I thought I jammed them, they were swollen for a month or whatever, I'd broken them. But what healed the body is, you know, or what healed the broke, the broken fingers? My body, you know. And the same thing happened after when I broke them in college uh, at Palmer. They healed on their own. And so, look, I want you to understand that the body can do amazing things and it can heal itself if, there's, if we understand where it's at in that and if we take away things that are impeding it. Uh, because I had one of the, I was talking with mo one mom last night and there was concern like my son is digressing, is struggling, it's getting tougher. You know, is this something, can he progress? Is he, is he stuck going? Is there momentum stuck going this direction? And I want to tell you that it does not have to stay that way, okay? The body is amazing thing and it does heal. We just have to take away the limitations. Okay. All right, so testimony number one, severe asthma, hospitalized three times by the age of five, chronically sick, uh, would get fevers multiple times a year of 100, 405, and, and father refused to move more than five minutes from the hospital. Asthma is a comorbidity of all these other uh, diagnoses, ADHD and other things. And so um, this, this is me. That, this is my story, okay? Uh, I remember being adjusted at, so it's been 30 years since I've had an asthma attack. It's been 30 years since I've spiked fevers of 104, 105. Um, not that I've never been sick again or anything like that, but I've never spiked to that level repeatedly throughout the years. Uh, I remember being adjusted at the age of five and a couple times, but I won't, I remember one specific adjustment and after that or a few other visits right after that, I never had another asthma attack again. I haven't used an inhaler in 30 years. You know, it was a night and day difference. Now, they told me that I grew out of it, right? So I didn't have asthma attacks, but when I would go play, you know, basketball, I'd always get a little bit winded. And so uh, in college, I decided that I thought about joining the military and uh, wanted to be a medic and everything like that. And so, uh, but I played a lot of sports, I had back pain. And I, you know, in high school, I was the guy that always got winded. And sure enough, I was seeing a chiropractor for some of the aches and pains of sports. And, you know, it all went away. I mean, I ran a five minute, 15 second mile uh, doing my uh, military or ROTC training. 
And so, look, there's a phenomenal change. So, look, we're not stuck in this. A diagnosis oftentimes are limiting to these kids. And I, I want to give you hope in the sense that, look, things can change, things can improve. All right. So we are seeing, though, a massive spike in these things. The prevalence of, of autism uh, in 2000 was uh, 1 in 150. And as of two, 2014, it's 1 in 59. And I've seen some other numbers that have shown it's, it's still trickling down that direction right now. And, you know, there's been questions like, is this because we're better, we're more aware of this, right? That's a common question, right? Are we more aware of what's going on? And the answer to that is it's 50-50. Yes, we are more aware. You know, kiddos that may have not been given this diagnosis back in the 80s, 90s are gonna get it now. Uh, but also they, about 40 to 50% of these kiddos, there's no explanation. So it's not because we're better practitioners. It's not because, of, you know, we have better, more knowledge. It's not because of anything other than it's just happening. Okay, ADHD, same trend. Uh, I don't remember, granted I was, I was homeschooled, but I still had lots of friends uh, and was, you know, out, you know, part of my church group. And so I was around a lot of kids. I don't remember anybody with ADHD when I was growing up uh, in high school. It wasn't even until I got into college. And even then it was still kind of sparse. It wasn't until I was in college though that I was introduced, just one of my friends uh, had Ritalin and he, you know, he offered it to me. I had no idea what it was. He said, you know, can, are you having trouble focusing? You know, it was for a physics exam. And I said, yeah, I'm having a little trouble. He's like, yeah, me too. Here's a, here's a Ritalin. I should have never done it, but I took the, you know, I took it and wow, does it work? I mean, it, the high is high and the low is low in that scenario, but it helped. But it was such a, <clears throat> it was a, a novel thing to me. I didn't understand why he was talking about it and that medication can help that, but we're seeing it more and more now. I mean, if there's a, I forget what the documentary is in, on Netflix, but you're talking, they're, they're documenting college students in and out and they're just the rampant use of it, whether or not they have the diagnosis and they're just buying it from other students. And so we're just kind of seeing this, it's just growing and growing. All right. Common comorbidities. So I, I'm interested. Here's a, here's a poll. I want to know. Um, so what this is saying here is that 64% of kiddos have more than two diagnoses. Okay, meaning ADHD and anxiety, ADHD and depression, ADHD and autism. You know, is this true? Are you? Do your kiddos have more than one diagnosis? Go ahead and. Um, is that true? Are you? Are you say, I, I see this all the time. Most of my kids have ADHD and something else or autism and something else. But I'm curious, you know, have you been given two diagnoses? I know this is a slight day. So I'm going to keep going though. So what this is telling you though, if 64% have common comorbidities, meaning that uh, they have ADHD and something or autism and something. It's telling you that together these kiddos have the same, you know, concerns, right? There, there's commonality among them. Four, okay. Three. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we're seeing this. Okay, so look, the kids I'm seeing are typically are not coming in with one issue. Um, not that it doesn't happen, but you know when there's one, it's typically more manageable than two or three, right? And so, you know, you're getting kids with ADHD and anxiety, uh, a, uh, autism and sensory processing, ADHD and anxiety, and so we have this combo effect that is difficult for parents to understand, difficult for kids to to understand themselves, and and, and unfortunately, teachers are, are struggling too, and so. Look, there's a lot of commonality here. That's the bright spot in here is that there is commonality. So that means that there's common ground here. So if we can start attacking these commonalities, we can start addressing multiple diagnoses at the same time. Isn't that kind of cool? All right, uh, so this is Tourette's syndrome. This is just another slide. Um, this is from 2011, 2012. 65,000 kids, uh, and it's just showing Tourette's syndrome and other neurobehavioral 
disorders, depression, anxiety, asthma is on there. Uh, but the point of this slide, again, is just to reaffirm that these diagnoses have a lot in common, a lot. And that's why you get a lot of common uh, repetition like uh, autism and ADHD or ADHD and anxiety. They, they have a commonality, they're all rooted in, in brain development. And so if we look at brain development, we can peel away the onion and understand these kiddos better. Uh, reading disorders and uh, specific learning disorders. Again, this is just highlighting that uh, with the diagnosis of reading disorder, commonality with ADHD, depression, anxiety, again, just tying this all together that, look, there's a commonality here. All right, uh, I'm gonna give you a second to comment, but have you all heard of the canary in the coal mine? And if you have, what does it mean? I'm gonna, there are some people text messaging me, so I'm just trying to make sure that everybody gets in. Have you heard of this? Canary in the coal mine. And I know there's a little bit of delay. <clears throat> All right, so canary in the coal mine uh, is, back in the day, coal miners would use canaries as an alarm system. <laughs> Stop singing, run, yes, yes. So back in the day, uh, the canaries were used as like a rudimentary alarm system. They were more sensitive, okay, to uh, noxious gases. Um, I think carbon monoxide was it. They were more sensitive to carbon monoxide. So they would, uh, they would die. They would stop singing essentially, right? And so when a coal miner saw this, time to run. You're not wasting time in there. You're not digging any further. It's time to go. Okay. And so this is, this is what I'm hearing though. Okay. Is the, in, in the, in the, the comic is saying that's normal, right? Is the canary's death is not normal. That's common, but not normal. And so what I'm saying is, is that although the, we're getting all these common diagnoses, this is not normal. Um, and so we need to, we need to be aware of this because I commonly hear this is normal, that they'll grow out of this, that this is acceptable, this is okay, look, don't worry about this. And I'm saying, parents, you're seeing the canary and you're being told it's okay, no worries, all this stuff. And I'm, I'm letting you know, look, intuition is a, is a vital thing. Listen to your gut and so, um, it is so important that you listen to your gut. Basically, that's what I want to say with that. Okay, all right. Sorry, still having people trouble getting. Uh, still having trouble people getting in. Okay, cake anyone? All right. So um, this is a cake. I'm not hungry right now, but sometimes when I give this uh, talk, I am hungry. Okay. So this is a beautiful, delicious cake, and. Uh, Let's say I'm gonna make this cake, okay? But the way I'm gonna make this is I'm gonna take whole eggs, I'm not gonna crack them, I'm gonna put them in there, I'm gonna take the the uh, the bake mix, I'm gonna put it on top of that, and then I'm gonna take the strawberries, kind of smash them up, and then drizzle the chocolate over it and uh, put it on broil for 500 degrees, okay? Do you wanna eat this cake? What have I missed in this whole scenario? I'm not gonna wait for you to comment. Uh, I missed the recipe, right? There's, there's an order of operations to making this delicious cake. You can't just throw things together and it magically appears. So look, we have a recipe with these kiddos. And the recipe starts with brain development and it goes through primitive reflexes, motor and touch processing, auditory processing, and visual processing, okay? Well, let me see here. All right, this is your meat and potatoes slide. Your child is somewhere in this primitive through visual processing, okay? There's somewhere there. This is how every individual in the world, all seven billion of us, have developed, okay? So identifying this is key. Why is this key? Because when you understand where your child is in this 
this order, this recipe, okay? When you understand where they are, it does a couple different things. It tells you what you need to do next, okay? It also tells you how you need to communicate and it helps you understand why they do things, okay? And so, look, no behavior is just a pointless behavior. All behavior has a purpose. Behavior has a purpose, okay? So often, behavior is misconstrued as they're naughty or they're bad or they don't care or they're lazy, okay? And that's not the case. And I'll, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, I have a 15-year-old, okay? In her world, she is stuck in the primitive reflexes motor touch uh, processing, okay? This girl spins. That's actually how she processes her world. She spins. So if given any given moment you see her spinning, it's because she's trying to understand her world, okay? Uh, it, this, she doesn't spin inherently because she enjoys it. She spins because that's how she needs to process her world. Well, her auditory processing, so you see the, the third bullet point down there, auditory processing. What that means is developmentally, she has trouble processing her world unless she's spinning. So she's very poor at taking auditory commands. Hey, I'm not going to use her name, obviously. Susie, go pick up your socks, do your homework, and come down for dinner at 6.30. Susie will walk off and forget what you told her to do. Not because she's lazy. Not because she doesn't care. Not because she's a poor student. She just cannot process her world through listening. That she has to move. So when she does homework, she spins. But in the classroom, she can't spin. So she struggles to understand the material. So how do you know, you need to start looking at your kiddos because their behavior is giving you insight, okay? Most kiddos that come in are somewhere stuck between the primitive reflexes and the motor touch. Most of them, most of them. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way, but most of them are stuck somewhere in that world. So this is important. So, okay, we're gonna talk about brain development. This is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna try to make this a little heavier slide and then kind of go through the rest of it. A little bit quicker but primitive reflexes have you ever heard of primitive reflexes go ahead and comment there's one other person that's struggling to get in so i'm gonna try to get her in real quick primitive reflexes have you ever have you ever looked into them are you familiar with them okay all right you're, you're familiar with them what do you know about them what have you have you been tested for them uh, here, is your kid have been tested for them? What's going on? No, okay, so you're not familiar with them? No, no, okay. This is, um, this is, this is key, okay. So, primitive reflexes are the, they're the, the right, they're the code in our brain that when we're born helps us either get through the birth canal and then function immediately. Okay, a baby does, does it intuitively, okay, you went to bring downs. Um, does it intuitively, there's no program, they don't know that a nipple's a nipple and that there's a program that says if there's something touching here, I'm gonna suck on it. That's the way that it works. That's why you can put a nipple or a finger there and they'll start sucking at it, okay? There's also, uh, there's one called the Gallant reflex. This is what helps the baby kind of wiggle through the birth canal. If that doesn't turn off, kid has ADHD symptoms and bedwetting are the two most common ones. Okay, so there's this, it's pre-written program, okay? And as you develop, as they start to crawl, as they start to do other things, the motor touch stuff, as they start to do that, as they come from the back of the brain, that's where the primitive reflexes are back here, and they start developing the higher parts of their brain, then those things get shut down, okay? But if your kiddo has primitive reflexes, that means they process the world from their brainstem. And from the brainstem, it's a different world, okay? It is a completely different world. You, a primitive reflex is meant to have a stimulus and then a response, and you really have no control over it, okay? And so we have these kids with these programs that have not been overrided by higher parts of our brain, involved with emotional regulation, involved with executive function, and so they're stuck back here. And 
It doesn't matter if they're five or 17 or 25, really. Okay, if they're stuck back there, they're gonna be 17, but act like they're uh, a two-year-old, okay? These are the kiddos. I don't wanna over, look, there's a ton of different things that goes on, but a lot of times these are the kiddos, especially when they get about into third grade, where you'll see emotional behavior uh, issues and they'll, they'll, they'll punch their friend, right? And you're like, Jimmy, why'd you punch your friend? And like, I don't know. Jimmy, do you know why you're in trouble? Not really. And they're, and they're confused and you're like, well, why don't, you know, Jimmy, you, you punch Dave right in the face. And you know, why, you know, why did you do that? I don't, I don't know. You know, why did, they, and they struggle to understand that actions have consequences, right? Because neurodevelopmentally, they're stuck back here. They're stuck in a reactionary mode. So if you have a kiddo who is reactionary, emotionally dysregulated, is struggling to get stressed out easily, cannot control their emotions, these kiddos oftentimes, not always, oftentimes though, a majority of the time, are, have primitive reflexes. And so their brain cannot process their environment well. Very, very limited. So you need to have these tested. Um, what I see is once we incorporate motor and touch, so once we help them move into the next phase, uh, then what happens as you start integrating the brain and the body, those primitive reflexes go down and they get suppressed. They can come back uh, with severe brain trauma, like a concussion. That's why you'll have like a, you know, 17 year old high school senior, you know, star athlete, you know, homecoming king sort of deal, you know, a student and he gets clocked in the head and his grades go to crap. And, you know, his, you know, he breaks up with his girlfriend and he starts picking fights with you. That's why that happens. And so if your kiddo is struggling to, you know, socially interact, is struggling with social, um, social emotional cues, right? Like they don't understand that if I punch David in the face that he's not gonna wanna be my friend, they're most likely stuck in this world. And until you can get them into that motor touch processing and start suppressing those primitive reflexes, they're always gonna be there. The good news is you can get them out of those primitive reflexes, so that's, that's key. The next one's motor touch processing. And this is where our kids, this is why crawling is so important because that's how we start developing the hemispheres of our brain. That's how we start incorporating the lower and some of the mid part of the brain. And so that's why things like touch and balance are very, very key. Uh, quick question, how many of your kiddos struggle with balance? Groups. Any of them struggle with balance? Okay, yeah. This is the most common one. All right, so I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit about how movement is important, okay? So the brain wants to know where we are in space at all times, all times. And I'll give you the, the primary reason for this, okay? Is if a bear was to start coming after me, I want to know where my hands are, where my feet are, in relationship to space, right? Like if there's a log there, but I don't know my feet are over here, over there, it is very taxing for the brain. So what we have is, when we have balance issues, the higher parts of your brain, so let's see, our executive part right here, it's called prefrontal cortex. This is monitoring, this is, uh, it monitors the lower parts of our brain, but this is the part that suppresses, you know, emotional outbursts. This is the one that helps you plan and coordinate executive function, academics, the understanding that if I punch David in the face, he may not want to be my friend or that I'm going to be punished, okay? So when we have clumsy kids, so their motor and processing, their touch and motor uh, processing is very poor, this part of the brain, the part of the brain that's going to say, Hey, I don't need to yell at that person. If I yell at you know, my mom, there's consequences. That wasn't nice. I shouldn't punch my friend, all this stuff. This starts monitoring back here. And this is the balance area called the cerebellum, uh, which also has a strong correlation to language stuff, which is auditory processing, right? So um, look, if their motor and touch is not being processed and they don't have good balance, this part of the brain, the reasonable part of the brain, the one that can, you know, 
plan out, look, I need to, uh, you know, I need to spend 45 minutes tonight studying for my history exam. Um, I know I should push my sister down the stairs, all this stuff. It stops doing what it's supposed to do and starts monitoring this. Okay, so balance and touch is massive, massive. This is my world. This is where I, this is where I come in as a chiropractor. Because if I can improve motor and touch processing, and I can improve balance, it suppresses the primitive reflexes. So we start seeing you know, more emotional control. We start seeing better balance. So the executive function starts kicking in. That also kicks, jump starts the auditory processing. So the, the, they're able to better understand their world a little bit better through, through verbally. And then eventually, you cannot have good visual processing if you have poor balance. It's just done. If your camera, like, well, my camera's on a, a desk here, but if I kept, if it was on an unstable surface, right, and I'm shaking like this, how would you process your world, okay? So I would venture to say that 90% of kids with ADHD have a visual processing issue. Eyes aren't coordinated. Their world is not stable, and therefore they cannot focus on uh, anything. It's very common in uh, um, sensory processing as well. Again, I'd say it's about 90%, at least of the kiddos I see. Autism is the same way, okay? All right, so your kiddos are stuck somewhere in here. It sounds like a lot of yours are stuck in the motor touch, probably have some primitive reflexes there, but I want you to understand that if we don't jump over these hurdles, if we don't integrate these reflexes, if we don't integrate motor and touch and help them balance in the world, the rest of it's shot. They're not gonna understand well verbal commands. They're also gonna to struggle to get the fine nuances of communication verbally, meaning they may not pick up on sarcasm as well, right? So you may be, you know, just, you, maybe you're playing with them, you're joking with them, and you, you're joking, you tease them a little bit, right? And, and your tone is in jest, right? You, you're, you just have a little bit of fun with them and you're loving up on them, right? But they're hurt. Part of it is because they may not be able to process the tones well and they're therefore they're struggling. And then uh, visual processing. I cannot highlight this enough. This is key. Every kid who has balance issues has a visual processing issue. Visual processing leads to all sorts of stuff. One, if you can't visually process what's going across your, you know, what you're reading, what's going through your screen, all of that stuff, you can't visually interpret or process facial expressions, right? Like you don't know if this is a smile or, you know, am I gritting my teeth at you because I'm mad. So these things are, are, are key. Now I want you to kind of think about your kiddo right now. A lot of you talked about balance. Okay, so there's probably a lot there, but I want you to think about how they process their world. And so do they process auditory commands well? If I tell Jimmy to go you know, pick up socks, do homework, or do whatever, do they follow through? Start thinking about this stuff, because if you understand this, this will help your communication, okay? Because especially what I see commonly with ADHD, sensory processing, autism, these kids are easily overwhelmed visually and auditory, okay? And so one of the things that you can help them, or one of the ways you can help them is by, um, predicting the future, okay? So this goes back to motor and touch. When the brain has a good idea of where you are in space, it can predict how things are gonna move through the environment, which is very important for your safety, but also over time helps us predict our actions and so forth and so on. It allows us to foresee the future, kind of crazy, right? So if your child is stuck in motor touch and processing and they struggle to understand the future. It happens, it's all the time. Look, one of the easiest things you can do, especially during high stress moments, holidays, um, transitions in school, right? Going to school or, or uh, ending school, you know, starting summer, when there's gonna be a massive flip in their schedule, in the routine and how they function, you need to help them understand, predict. Some, are, some of our kiddos are so stuck in primitive reflexes and more touch, you need to help them process their entire day. Meaning that you can help your kids out a lot by just going the, either that morning or the night before and writing out, it doesn't have to be like, you know, 7.30 this, but you know, in the morning we're gonna eat breakfast, then we're gonna get dressed, 
and we're gonna brush our teeth and you're gonna help them understand, understand what is going on and what's happening. This is one of the easiest ways to help your kids because if they don't understand the future, they're naturally gonna be anxious, okay? Were some of us anxious when we didn't know like what's gonna to happen to your business? You know, could I catch COVID? You know, am I gonna, you know, what? You know, all that uncertainty led parents to be anxious, right? So imagine living your entire day in that COVID scenario, right? Where you don't know what's coming up the next day, where you don't understand like school's ending now and so there's a new transition. Why are my friends not, <coughs> excuse me, allergy cough. Um, why are my friends not around anymore? So look, I want you to start thinking about ways that you can help your kiddos understand big events are huge, okay? Holidays are huge. We're going to grandma's house. You know, we were there last year for Christmas. Do you remember this house? You can show them a picture, picture grandma, picture the house. Do you remember, you know, do you remember this all? And it to you and I, it may sound kind of, you know, like why? Why would they need to see that? They were there last year, but in their brains, they don't have that predictive ability. They don't understand that, you know, December 24th, we go to grandma's every year and we open presents or whatever you do, right? So that is key. Making sure that your kiddos, you know, suppress some of that anxiety for them by helping them understand their day and the big events that are coming up. Let me know, did that help at all or is that just, or is that not helpful? I know there's a delay. <clears throat> All right, well, I hope that was helpful, okay? I'm gonna go on to auditory processing. Um, look, if your kiddo struggles with auditory processing, meaning you give them a set of commands, do one, two, three, and they 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 don't ever do it, okay? They, they just never do it. You're like, man, this kid is so lazy. What if they, if they understand but they don't care? Okay, that's a different thing. That's uh, apathy, okay? Um, I'll touch a little bit on that. So apathy, that can be a different, that, so there's a motivational issue there. So um, that one, they understand but they're apathetic. That is, ooh, that's a processing disorder, but that is, let me, I, that's a, that's a tough one because I have kiddos that think they understand and I, this is what I mean by, and this may not be your scenario. So we may have to do like a little one-on-one -on -one so I can understand exactly. But like I have kids that understand that a sandwich exists in the world. Okay. But if I ask them to go make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they don't have the working memory of how to build a sandwich to do it. Okay. So Theoretically, they know that sandwiches exist, right? But they don't know how to process the information to create the sandwich. That's a huge issue. Um, and it has nothing to do, and that can, you know, so that could be part of their motivation, right? Like, I know a sandwich exists, but I, but then the fear of like not knowing where to start in the order, the executive function part, like, okay, I need two slices of bread. Okay, then I'm gonna put peanut butter on this side, my jelly on this side. There's some working memory and executive function involved there. If they're stuck back here because they process the world differently, they may struggle with it. Um, apathy could be a different thing though. Um, so with apathy, I commonly will see a very suppressed nervous system. Um, and there's a part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, which involves the fight or flight. So I see a tiger, I run, there's some sort of danger, I run or I fight, or there's the other part of it, um, that's the parasympathetic or the rest and relaxation. I've seen kiddos very suppressed on that parasympathetic and they are so suppressed that they have zero motivation and they can comprehend what's going on, but their, 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 their body's literally suppressing itself. And that can be a completely different issue. Um, yep. Okay. So Rebecca, you're absolutely right. That was the point I was trying to hit. So you nailed it, okay? Kiddos can understand 
they can understand a concept in, in, in theory, right? Okay. But they don't know the steps and the orders of how to do it. Okay. And so they seem very apathetic. They seem lazy. They seem like they don't care, but in reality, they don't know where to start. And so, um, that is a big issue. If they don't know where to start, then they easily become overwhelmed. And that leads to all sorts of other issues, like them looking lazy, them not accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Um, he knows how to do the dishes, but a big fight. Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay, so I, going back to the other part of it. Okay, so he may know, like I, I've seen mom wash the dishes, but in putting the order of operations together for that, he may not understand the order of operations. Again, that's kind of like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's called working memory. It's the, it's the understanding like, look, okay, I need to get the dishes on this end of the, of the sink. I need to put warm water in here or whatever, you know, dishwasher. When I was growing up, we didn't have the dishwasher. So, um, you know, I'd put the dishes here, warm water in here, rinse sink here, dry thing here. And I had an order too, and I, and I had also an order of like how I would wash things, right? So that they would fit right or, um, you know, so that can be a huge issue. Checklists are big. Checklists can help. The, the thing I, um, that I want you to be uh, cognizant of with um, checklists is if you give them too much, some children can't work their way through it. And so you may need to just give them one at a time. Like you may have to have a checklist like, look, uh, Jimmy, this is what we're accomplishing today, okay? So they can see the big picture and then give them one piece at a time. So, you know, maybe like a rip net, you know, like rip away, like, Jimmy, go clean up your toys or something or whatever. Um, yeah, we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. That's a lot of these questions have very, can have very complex answers and I may not know part of the backstory. So that will help me understand them. So, um, Yes, lists are very helpful. So look, if you want a one-on-one, -on -one, I will give that offer at the end, but some of these are really very complex, so I'm not gonna be able to answer in a very broad topic or broad way that can help a lot of people at one time. So very specific questions, or like if you wanna dive deeper, like ah, that doesn't fit, that mold doesn't fit my kiddo, happy to do that with you. It just, you know, I'm trying to help as many people as possible. Okay, all right, let's go next, okay. So things that alter development, okay? There's three things. And these are important. Um, look, physical trauma, look, I, I talked about my, the, um, my son's birth. I, my birth, uh, I came out like this with my um, fist up against the top of my neck. Um, and so knowing the physiology and how it responds is a big nerve that comes out of here called the vagus nerve that influences breathing, heart rate, all that stuff. I think that was the cause of my asthma, okay? Uh, and other stresses like pollen and, and you know, flu season and other stuff just added up on stress until it over, overcame me. And so, but um, there's lots of different things that I see kids come in for. One of the more common things that I see, it, it can be C-section births. Those are quite traumatic. Um, we've had a couple of those come in recently. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, broken clavicle to um, their skull is informing correctly to all sorts of little things that goes with them. But birth in and of itself, whether, you know, vaginal or C-section can be quite traumatic in kids. Falls. Okay. I have a three-year-old son. Look, if you ask me if he's had any serious traumas, he's got one scar right here. So I would remember that one. The kid is scorpions. I don't know. Like, so, so scorpions, like when you land on your head and then your, your legs go behind you like BMX bikers and skaters do it all the time you see it so they, so they call it they call it a scorpion but I swear the kid he thinks he's spider-man so I think he does it probably I don't know once a month but if you ask me this is I mean this is part of the problem right when you ask me like is he had any serious traumas like I know he's fallen I just don't remember he, I never I haven't taken him to the hospital for anything right so these kids experience a lot of traumas oftentimes especially if they're clumsy too um, and so falls, traumas, you know, we've had a couple of infants that have been in, or kiddos that have been in more vehicle accidents, sports, gymnastics. Uh, do any of your kids play soccer? So 
So soccer in females and adolescents is the number one reason for concussions. I didn't know that until recently. I would have thought it was football, but female soccer players, uh, I think elementary through high school is the number one cause of concussions. Okay, so I hope you're starting to think about how your child processes the wor your, their world, okay? Do they process it through motor and touch? Do they have to be constantly moving? And if you're talking to them, they have to be moving, or you know, if you ask them to do something, they have to be spinning. Do they struggle with listening to commands? Do they struggle with that? Do they struggle with visual focus? Um, you know, start thinking about these things because this is gonna help you start understanding your child, like understanding the way they look at the world because they look at the world differently than we do, okay? Or at least most of us do. So um, chemical traumas, poor diets, medications, heavy metals, those all play, they all impact or alter development, okay? So, you know, I'm gonna guess somewhere on this list, your child has experienced one or more of these, okay? Um, look, when we got pregnant with uh, my son, um, my wife and I were both working, you know, I don't know, 60 hour weeks, uh, you know, we were in our, we were thir uh, our early 30s, so, you know, we didn't have like, you know, we were in good shape, but we weren't overly concerned about our diet, right? You know, we weren't thinking about having a child sort of deal. And so he ended up getting a lot of lip, oops, sorry, lip and tongue ties too. So we had to have that corrected right away. But I saw the impact of the way my diet uh, impacted his development too, right? So um, yeah, let me ask you, do any of you know if your child has a lip or tongue tie? Have y'all looked at that? Have you heard of that? Are you familiar with that? Let me know, I wanna hear this. I'm gonna proceed forward, but um, mine is both. Okay, so this is a common thing. Um, were they revised? Were they revised? This is another topic um, that I think should be talked about because it plays a role in both sensory processing. Um, I have a, actually, I think her testimony is coming up, so I'll talk about her in just a second, but um, not revised, okay. Good, okay. So uh, lip and tongue ties are a methylation issue. So I'm sure a lot of you uh, have heard of uh, MTFR gene, right? So that's a methylation gene. Um, so that's, there's a methylation issue with um, our synthetic B vitamins, okay? So um, my wife actually, when she got uh, out of prenatal, um, she thought it was a good prenatal and it ended up being a bad one and it had a, a synthetic B and so she didn't process it right. Uh, and so there was, you know, there was an issue with uh, tongue and lip ties. Okay, all right, uh, okay, another testimony. Five-year-old kid, uh, autism. So diagnosed with autism. This kid is cool. I liked him a lot. He's, uh, unfortunately, I stopped care for a little bit under because of COVID, so I haven't seen him for a few weeks. But um, So he started care at the beginning of last school year. Uh, Dad came to this, this workshop, and uh, he heard that chiropractors didn't help with autism, so he wanted to check me out. So anyways, we do an exam on him. This is some of the exam stuff that I do right here. Uh, you can see the picture. But um, so it comes in, speech delay. Um, it just recently been diagnosed with autism. Um, Dad's like, I don't, you know, they didn't tell me a whole lot. They just said he's on the spectrum. Uh, and he's got delayed speech. And um, he didn't play well with uh, some of the other kids that were there in his preschool. And so uh, it gets this diagnosis. So anyways, we do an exam. And start working on him. And this kiddo, I mean, I cannot get him to be quiet. If he has a speech delay, you cannot tell anymore. Uh, he just is a chatty Kathy. I mean, oh my gosh, the kid just talk. He tells me everything, right? Like he, he has a, um, he does have some autistic tendencies, right? Like he is, uh, but he very intelligent when it comes to like astronomy and stuff and so like he knows all this stuff and so he's just telling me all this stuff and he just keeps talking so if he had a speech like 
after he started care, it went away because this kid is just just can't get him to be quiet. Delayed reader too, so he's behind uh, when they did the um, the star testing. He was behind that and and uh, and math. So uh, so they did that initial testing and then they came in December or they were being seen in, the, uh, in December when they re or November whenever they retook the the uh, test. He was exceeded his peers in both reading uh, and and math. I, I never took the star test, so I don't know a lot about it. But his dad comes in, he's like, you know, he was behind, and now he's you know advanced in his class. He's just a chatty Kathy. So it's really cool to see. And I want to point this out because look, kids are given a diagnosis, and a lot of times they're pigeonholed into this diagnosis, and I that breaks my heart. These kiddos are not their diagnosis, right? The diagnosis is just symptoms of what we're seeing going on developmentally. And so, again, I, I don't remember the name of the mom I was talking to um, who was talking about, you know, her son kind of digressing and struggling a lot. Neuroplasticity, which is a newer thought in neurology uh, within the past few, uh, decade or two, is the idea that the brain can change and learn new things. Old dogs can learn new tricks, okay? And so they did a study uh, last year, I think, of uh, women in their mid-50s who meditated, did yoga, and I think exercise is what they included in it. And they showed that they had the brain of a 24 or 5-year-old. So look, kids are not trapped in these diagnoses. They're just names for symptoms that we're seeing. And so, look, there are things that you can do to help them process their world better, to function better, and, you know, to just live to their fullest potential. <laughs> so that is one of the things I want to just knock out of the park here. The diagnosis is not your kiddo. We need to understand where your kiddo is at, help the teachers understand where they're at, and best serve them, but they are not their diagnosis. Yep, it's a behavior. But again, behaviors are telling you something. They're telling you that the behavior is telling you where they are in their processing, their ability to process their world. And so one of the big things that I have for my kiddos with like auditory, auditory and visual uh, processing issues, which is most kids again, but what I'll tell the parents is, hey, look, when you're going to a party, uh, for instance, I had a um, another, he's a seven-year-old autistic kid, real severe autism though, um, and he could not handle family events. Like, he, he was just glued to his dad's neck. The entire, you know, there's too much auditory and visual processing, okay? Now, through care, he, he was able to play. I went to his uh, seventh, birthday and the kid was, you know, he's running around with all his friends and family. Uh, you would have not known that he had that. But for kiddo, for parents who are walking into a stressful scenario for the kiddos where a lot of noise, family, visual stimulus, you know, Christmas, Halloween, all that sort of stuff, you need to give them, I do this, uh, this for that 13-year-old ADHD, uh, ADHD kid that I'm seeing now, I gave her a game plan for events like this, okay? So, when they're going into like a high stressful scenario where there's going to be a lot of you know noise and sound and it's going to be coming overwhelming to them neurologically i told her she needs to have a game plan the mom's on with this too so they're doing it but there's a game plan for her to step away go so she brings a book with her and she steps away um for about 15 minutes and she decreases the demand on her nervous system and it helps her function in those environments so Again, she just started care, so we're still pushing through some of that stuff. Okay, so from a developmental standpoint, you need to start identifying these things, okay? Primitive reflexes, uh, heart rate variability. So that's measuring the autonomic nervous system. So that measures, are they stuck in the fight or flight mode? Or are they stuck in that very parasympathetic, apathetic, sometimes, state? And this system needs to be balanced. So when you get up in the morning, we have kind of a sympathetic drive, a cortisol goods into our blood, we kind of get moving and going and get motivated, okay? And then as the day shifts, we kind of have a back and forth of this, okay? So the system is kind of meant to be back and forth, okay? And so um, when it gets stuck in one realm, our kids cannot adapt to stress, and so we need to identify that. Uh, I am looking to actually do a big study, uh, hopefully in the next year with um, the chiropractic college on heart rate variability and kiddos with ADHD. So I'm excited about that. Uh, thermography is just another way of looking at the autonomic nervous system. EMG, static EMG. What that does is it measures the muscle activity. Okay, so why does that matter? That matters in posture. 
but it also matters as far as background processing. Okay, so if you're stuck in a motor touch world and you have to process all this muscle tension all the time, it is stealing focus, attention, emotional regulation, executive function from up here to put it down here. So that is key. Uh, if you go back to this, so this is that uh, ADHD kiddo, the uh, upper right one with all the red, black, and yellow, and, and uh, blue there, that's an EMG. So it's telling me how active is his muscles. So how much background noise does he have to process his world? Uh, posture, uh, brain-body connection. So what that is, is uh, I do some of the exams that officers do, right, when they're testing for intoxication, you know, like uh, finger to nose sort of deal. 99 out of 100 kids cannot do this well repeatedly. You have them close their eyes and they're over here. Brain-body connection is shot. Once you take away the visual, which again, okay, so visual is a high sensory world. So they're, they're visually accepting all this information and it's helping them kind of navigate this stuff. So they're compensating visually. But once the moment you take that away, they're all over the place. It's the same idea, okay? And then eye movements. Um, that little 13-year-old sister is coming in for emotional dysregulation. And when I have her, when I have her watch my finger and her eyes should come, uh, come in together like this, the left eye does not. So that means anything that's close to her face, she cannot process because her eyes are getting two different, her brain's interpreting two different visual stimuli. Very fatiguing on the brain because you're constantly having to navigate and negotiate what's actually happening in your world. And she's a very touch oriented one too. So uh, sister's auditory, uh, uh, 13 year old's auditory, the other sister is movement and touch. This girl is always moving. Okay, um, all right, so here's, we're, gonna, we're gonna go into a little bit of science here. Look, early motor signs and um, ADHD, okay? So uh, quick question again, did your, I know balance is an issue. Did your kids crawl on time? Did they struggle to crawl, okay? When you look at this, uh, you can kind of see in this right-hand corner over here, you know, learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, uh, visual spatial, so they don't understand where they are in the world of things, uh, inhibitory control of emotions. So look, motor movement is, is, the, is the foundation for you to process auditory and visual world, okay? And so if your kids have poor balance, look, that's where you gotta start, okay? Um, same idea. Uh, so of the total sample, 88% exhibited some or definite differences in sensory processing and integration. Early in everything. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, you and I definitely need to talk. Okay. Um, but, you know, that those difficulties impact social participation. They impact hearing, body awareness. You can kind of see it. Sorry. I wish I could highlight it. I don't have my little marker. I can't find it. Uh, it affects body awareness, balance, motion, planning, and ideation. So look, these kiddos, when they do not have processing abilities, motor and touch, their world starts to become very limited in what they can process. And so this is very important to identify and then start helping. All right, this is how the brain works. I'll make sure to show uh, this slide right here. Um, look, it's brain environment. That's how, that's how we process the world. You get input in, export out. It's not quite that simple because we get input in and the brain processes it. And if you look down on the ADHD brain, the brain is not coordinated in the communication. So it comes up. We don't have a coordinated, you know, like uh, coordination in the processing of it. And then what happens? The output is poor. And so that's why we struggle with focus. That's why we struggle with emotional dysregulation. That's why we struggle with all this stuff. There's an incoherency in the brain. Low self-esteem, yeah. <clears throat> that happens for two different reasons. Um, one, it, there's a physiological reason why I see it often. Uh, that can do with the HRV and the, the EMG. But also there's the, the social impact of not feeling like you fit in, okay? And so again, I want you to start looking at the behaviors of your kids, understanding that this behavior is not purposeless. It does not, have, it, it has a purpose. There's a reason why they do this. And in doing so, 
you know, you're going to help, you can help them identify different things too. You can understand them better, which can help you communicate better. Because a lot of times these kiddos will not understand why they're being punished. They won't understand why there's difficulty with friends and so forth and so on. So this can really help and helps you as a parent identify with them. Okay. You have a low self-esteem. Okay. Uh, this is the idea again. So in the spine is spine is central. So everything comes center out, right? So actually the brain develops like this, uh, back to front, uh, bottom to top, right to left, middle out. Okay. So it does like a flower sort of deal. Okay. But the spine is the center. So the center of the kind of the system as far as nerves and uh, movement touch. And so when the spine is not moving well because of muscle tone, different stressors, posture, uh, that is impacting input to the brain. It's called proprioception, and it's the body's awareness and ability to identify where they are in space. And so that impacts that coordination uh, in this picture right here with the ADHD. If your brain is not functioning in the higher parts, but it's functioning down here, monitoring all this stuff, it's stealing away from how the brain should work in harmony. And so we need to coordinate the spine with the brain or the body in the brain, and that will help dramatically. All right, uh, I'm gonna skip through this. All right, so this was a study that was done on um, chiropractic care and the autonomic nervous system. So this is key too. Uh, I took out this slide, but HRV, autonomic nervous system, this system is autonomic. So it means it's in your brain stem. It regulates heart, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, oxygen, you know, all this stuff. So it has a massive impact on our function. These kids, because of their inability to predict the future, uh, because of their, you know, their struggle with the demands of visual and auditory, oftentimes get pushed into that fight or flight mode because they're constantly anxious about not understanding what's going on, not being able to predict. And so once you can do that, help your kid it'll process the world just a little bit better, you can help start bringing this down. And when you start doing that, they're going to start having better control of their emotion and how they process the world. But chiropractic care has been shown to impact that. All right. Guys, it's just a study that shows that uh, chiropractic impacts the brain. Uh, this is a study that shows uh, four kids with ADHD and some of the improvements. It's a pretty cool study. Um, okay, this is a big one. Okay. This is not a chiropractic study, so this has nothing to do. So difference in brain processing and proprioception. Okay, proprioception again is there's a bunch of sensors in my joints and they tell my brain I'm over here, okay? So if this is, if this is not good information and I go touch my nose and I end up over here, that's poor proprioception, poor body awareness. All right, so these, pay, these people had um, proprioception issues, okay, with reoccurrent non-specific low back pain, meaning they didn't have a specific reason, okay? Um, they just had back pain. There's no disc herniation or no, no fac fractures or anything like that, okay? Um, what they showed was the worse their proprioception, so the worse their body awareness, the more their amygdala, so that's part of the midbrain that's involved with emotional processing, was lit up. So the higher part of the brain, which suppresses the emotional part, wasn't suppressing it because it's down here trying to coordinate your body. Very interesting study. Yes, fight or flight is exactly what is happening right now. All of our kids are in fight or flight. It's happen it happens to all of us, right? Okay, so we're all kind of stressed out right now. The problem is our kiddos cannot predict. Like, they're not understanding that, hey, this, you know, what's going on, what's happening. And so they are stuck in a, in a, a constant state of fight or flight. Their routine is shifted. So they're stuck there. We got to get them out of there. Um, what, uh, part of this is all, part of this is all of my... Um, Screen. Okay, so I, so I can't see part of it. Oh, postural sway. Okay, so uh, cerebellum. So that's what back here that coordinates all of our movements, allows us to do this, right? It's involved with language processing. They showed a difference in ADHD uh, volume or size and uh, postural sway. So basically what they said is this, if this isn't functioning, you're more likely to have ADHD. Okay. Um, oh, this is a cool one. Uh, so this was, um, they did a functional MRI, which means that they looked at it kind of uh, pre and post uh, adjustment. And this, you see interoception. Interoception is the ability to know myself, how I feel. I'm angry. I'm sad. And what they found is that all these little areas of the brain that interpret uh, external internal environments and navigate that, they started lighting up. 
So the, they were, what they were saying is, is that the parts of the brain that understood me, like I'm me, that's Timmy, and I'm angry at Timmy. So you, they, it helped them start regulating and identifying their emotional states. Um, yeah, so the cerebellum, so this area back here that's involved with this, there's uh, some vulnerability to drug addiction. That's why like, I, I understand the there are points, I'm not anti-medication, so please don't misinterpret that. Um, I'm anti not needed medication. And there are some instances where medication is needed, okay? But look, the, there, there's a tie to this being altered, the cerebellum being altered in ADHD. So there, there's a tie. And then there's an altered, uh, there's a connection between this being altered and drug addiction. And I, I one of my passions is I want as few kids on drugs as possible because I think that the drugs that they're putting on are gateways to uh, a drug abuse. Not intentionally. I think these kids are great kids. Just they're being put on all these stimulants. It's altering their brain and they're, it's hitting parts of the brain that are already susceptible to drug addiction. And so I, I think it's just kind of a, just an unfortunate scenario that we're, we're seeing. Okay. Yep. It's part of the drug addiction sort of deal. Okay. I'm going to skip this. Another cool study conducted in Auckland, New Zealand has shown, has shown that a period of chiropractic care, even, even in older adults, adults was able, able to improve these people's brain's ability to sense where their foot was and to help them process visual and sound information at the same time faster and more accurately and to be able to take a faster step if they wanted to. All this research shows us that your spinal function is very important for your ability to learn new movements and that chiropractic adjustments can help improve learning new movements. Okay, so the reason I wanted you to take that away. Look, they did it on older individuals. And so, look, old dogs can you learn new tricks, meaning kiddos have the ability to learn new things, okay? We're not stuck. That old idea that we're stuck in our brain stem is not or our, our brain that we can't grow or change, that neuroplasticity issue is not true. Neuroplasticity exists, and it, it, we need to take advantage of that, okay? All right, autonomic nervous system. So, look, the best way I describe this is we got kiddos with Corvette engines and bicycle brakes, okay? They cannot stop themselves from doing what they're doing, okay? Um, and this is important to understand for their behavior. They're driven by this system. This is a survival, survival system. This keeps us alive system. This does not like anything that's going to endanger us. So people confronting us, danger. If you're stuck in fight or flight mode, okay? I'm stuck in fight mode and you come at me trying to discipline me, I'm going to possibly perceive that as antagonistic. Ooh, you want, I'm in fight mode and you're coming at me. Let's fight. Attitude issues, right there. Their brain is stuck in the fight mode. It's not a bad kid, it's a kid whose brain is stuck and is not able to adapt. And so when the parent comes at them, when the teacher comes at them, not that the intention of the teacher or the parent is to be, you know, to fight, right, okay? What I'm saying is, is their brain perceives that as a threat. And their brain is gonna keep them alive over anything. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna combat that threat or run. So you'll see two things. You'll see kids, typically there's three things they do, technically do, but there's two common responses. One, they get combative, attitude issues. They, I don't, don't tell me what to do, you know, all of this stuff. Secondly, they pull in. So you get the very, very submissive kiddo and they look good in certain areas of life. So they may be really good in school, like the teacher's like, they're so compliant. And then you get them home and they're like, Bleh. And so what happened was, is they were able to suppress that autonomic nervous system just long enough until, boom, you got home and then they explode. So um, you will see this. They do one thing, they fight or they pull in typically. Those are the two most common ones. Some kids freeze. Uh, that's kind of the pulling in, but that's the other part of that system. But that's what's going on with your kids. So attitude issues, combative issues. I don't want to do this. You're a jerk mom. That is a brain who's in defense mode, who's ready to fight, who's trying to survive. 
All right. Um, HRV. So this is a, this is a study by a friend of mine who did uh, an HRV, which is measuring autonomic nervous system. She found an increase of fifty to three hundred percent over a year, which is pretty cool. All right. So it improved it over a year. What if they do both? Okay, so what that means is their system is flipping back and forth in real extremes, right? Or, or they have a, um, or they have an, enough integration of the system. So what you'll get is kids that are partially into systems, right? So they're partially, um, it's not an all or nothing sometimes. So they're partially they have some ability to for executive function, or they haven't had enough stress for that autonomic nervous system to be kind of like chronically stuck on, and so, um, but you can get both. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little less typical, but it does happen. But typically, that's kind of what I was talking about, like at school, or they'll, they'll pick a parent that they're combative with more than the other one. They'll, they'll withdraw from one parent and combat the other one. Uh, some of that has to do with, you know, just prior experience and where they're at. But um, it can happen. That's just a fight or flight response. That is, I'm trying to survive response, and they're trying to determine what's the best form of survival right? Like a possum plays dead, okay? Or does the possum fight? That's the scenario that their brain is kind of trying to navigate, okay? Is it better to fight mom and dad or is it better just to shut up? I mean, it, it can depend upon the kiddos. Some kids are old enough, maybe they've had a little bit more development and so they can, they may be a little bit more picky with some of their fights. They can kind of navigate a little bit better, but in the end, they're still stuck in that fight or flight mode. Another study on uh, autonomic nervous system improvement with um, chiropractic care. This is a cool one. They actually, this is a study that showed uh, neck pain, which I didn't, you went, well, a lot of people don't know this, but like 15 to 20% of kids with neurodevelopmental disorders have chronic pain. Isn't that crazy? Um, but what they showed is the adjustment increased blood volume to the brain. So one of the things that when you see part of the, in that one study, that functional MRI where those parts of the brain that are involved with understanding self lit up, you're seeing more blood flow to the brain. Um, okay, kicked out three preschool. Okay, yeah, this is this is one of this uh, this so this this little girl uh, started care like three years ago. Single mom got kicked out of preschool. Uh, so her mom's like, I'll do anything, sort of deal. And uh, the last school, uh, preschool she got kicked out of, she pushed her kid off a jungle gym and uh, broke his clavicle. Uh, really sweet girl, okay? I mean, really sweet. Plays with my kids all the time. All the time. And um, my mom didn't get a diagnosis, mom didn't want to do medication, mom was trying to do anything but that stuff. And so I uh, comes into care and we immediately started seeing things with like touch. Couldn't wear pants, now we're wearing pants. Didn't want to eat this food, started eating this food. Emotional regulation started to come in and you know, the mom's like, this is a different kiddo. And so, um, you know, this is important to understand. You know, the reason that she pushed the kid off the jungle gym is because her visual and auditory processing was overwhelmed. She went into fight or flight mode, and so she pushed the kid off for survival. Okay, threat, push. That's what happened. Not a bad kid. Not a naughty kid. Not a a violent kid. Right? How many kids do you think out there right now are being accused of being violent? when in fact they're just kiddos whose brains are stuck in fight or flight mode and the other kiddo, they're, you know, they're 13, 14, 15 now, and the other kiddo, uh, and they're stuck in a scenario with, um, you know, a lot of visual processing, auditory processing in school, and they can't do it, and then the kid gets in their face, bam, they punch them, right? It, it's not a bad kid. It's a kid who can't uh, understand their environment. Yeah, many kids, so many kids. It's unfortunate in my opinion it is almost criminal it should be criminal because of the way these kids are being misunderstood i think unfortunately a lot of these kids end up getting you know in, in serious trouble um, maybe have addiction issues as well on top of that and so it's just a sad scenario these kids can be helped it's just sad yeah it may be headaches headaches can come from a couple different areas headaches may be um so common headaches in kiddos um are, are tension in the neck muscles, okay? So their posture is so poor that their little muscles are pulling so hard. So it alters the blood flow to the brain, which can cause headaches and migraines. Uh, migraines come from altered blood flow to the brain. Uh, and then also they get tension headaches, which can lead, that just may be tension headaches, but also can lead to migraines as well. Oh my gosh, kicked out of kidney. 
yeah, you and I need to talk. Um, look, your kid's not bad, and I'm sure your kid is phenomenal. Um, like all the amazing kids that I have in this office, they're just misunderstood. So, look, not bad kids. Kids whose brains are not able to handle their environment. That's the key here, okay? Um, so chiropractors call the, the misalignments of the spine, which alters proprioception and the autonomic system. They call those vertebral subluxations, which just means um, joints that aren't functioning well in the spine. Uh, a osteopathic doctor in Germany did two studies. He found that 99 out of 100 kids at birth had some sort of misalignment. It can vary, and it can also be compounded by different things. So look, out of the 99, some of those kids are gonna have ADHD, some are gonna have autism, some are not gonna have a lot of symptoms because it, it depends upon the physical traumas, the emotional traumas, and the chemical traumas. Our, our beings are emotional, chemical, and physical, so you have to combine all this, but 99 out of 100. So we have kids that are just, they're there, right? They have the core wrapped around their neck or whatever, and they just need some other things to happen. Uh, you know, a scorpion or, um, you know, maybe sensory issues so they eat only chick, you know, Chick-fil-A or McDonald's, something like that. So there's things, this is not one thing equals this. Uh, it's multiple, but all right. I'm going to skip this line. All right, last testimony. All right, so this little girl right now is being seen. Um, she is five years old. Spent a year and a half in OT. Year and a half. And I love OT. Look, I have no problem with OTs. Um, they do phenomenal work. The problem with OTs is they're not looking at developmentally. They're trying to fill a gap with your kiddo, right? Like, your kiddo can't do this. Can't write. So we're going to make them write. If your kiddo has visual processing or motor processing, it doesn't matter how many times you make them write something. The processing is not there. You cannot force the processing there, okay? OT can help with kiddos who have that development there, right? Um, but if the development is not there, you're not going to do it. You cannot make a two-year-old write nicely. If they're there developmentally, it just does not happen, okay? And so, um, yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. OTs are phenomenal. I don't have a problem. I'm not bashing OTs. I love OTs. I work with OTs. But if you don't know where your kid is developmentally and you don't start integrating the reflexes, the motor touch, and then working your way through, it does not matter how long you spend in OT, okay? So this little one spent a year in OT, year and a half in OT, uh, was bedwetting when she started care in uh, February, end of February. Um, he refused to wear pants and ponytails, uh, emotional dysregulation, and picky eater. So I saw her on, let's see, sorry, I saw her yesterday. Has not bet, uh, so we took off April. So I didn't see her during April because of, we took, uh, we closed the office and everything. Um, has not had accidents for weeks now, like three weeks. Okay, phenomenal. She had the gallant reflex, okay? That's the reflex that helps you wiggle out of uh, the birth canal, okay? That's what it's there for. It was not turned off. It was there. Hers is turned off now, okay? So it hasn't had bedwinning issues um, in a couple weeks now which is phenomenal. I'm sorry, we only took off half of April. So I started seeing people at the end of April. So um, so it's, I think she's three weeks in or four weeks in without bedwetting. Um, phenomenal. Uh, could not wear pants. This is the same as that little girl that pushed her or her, her friend off of the jungle gym. Uh, couldn't wear pants. The touch is overwhelming to their brains. They cannot handle the touch. So, you know, look, you can't, if you can't handle touch, you cannot handle auditory and visual stimuli. Just cannot handle it. It's the way the brain works. And so uh, came in the other day with pants on of her own volition and, and a ponytail. And uh, it was funny because she's a big uh, Frozen fan. Like, so she came in, the mom's like, look. I'm like, was oh, there Frozen shoes or pants? You know? <laughs> I wasn't putting two two together. I was like, oh, get some Elsa stuff out or something. And she's like, no, she's wearing pants. And then uh, she came in the, for the next visit. She's wearing a ponytail. So, you know, I always compliment her ponytail when she wears it. So it's funny. But um, mom's like, you know, she's not bedwetting. Emotional regulation is better. She's trying more foods. She does have a tongue tie. Um, so we may have that revised. I'm trying to do a bunch of cranial work with her to avoid that. Um, but with a tongue tie, your tongue cannot move through your mouth well. Okay. So you have a, a you're naturally going to have a, some sensory uh, deprivation. Uh, you have altered sense. So that's why they're picky eaters. It's not inherently that they're just picky eaters or bad eaters. They cannot maneuver the food in their mouth well. And they don't know this, okay? Because 
they just started their life like this. So it's not like they know, okay? Uh, <laughs> so believe it or not, I just, so I look at this all the time, okay? Like uh, Brittany's had two or three tongue ties this past week that have come in, right? You know, the little kiddos like under a year that they've found them. Um, and I'm like, so I'm talking to my sister who I think has a tongue tie. Um, he's got sensory issues. And I, I, so I was like, look, this is a tie here. And I look, I have a tongue tie. And I remember when I was young, like my sense, I did not like a lot of different foods. And my parents always thought I was a bad eater. You're a bad eater. Well, no, if my tongue can't move through my mouth and clear food well, I'm gonna only like foods that melt in my mouth, like chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese. It's not like, a, it's, not a, it's not a thing. It's I'm not a bad eater. I'm just an eater who likes foods that I can um, process easily, right? Uh, but that also goes into speech too. This five-year-old right here has, has delayed speech. The, the autistic kiddo too, that I mentioned too, who had delayed speech, he has a tongue tie. So until he started care and could move his tongue a little bit better through his mouth, his articulation was poor. He had trouble speaking. If somebody pulled your tongue down so you could only talk with this, do you think your speech would be altered? Yes. Veggies is a great example as well, yes. The, um, hey, Brittany, that's my wife. Um, so veggies is uh, key. If they cannot clear the food, if they cannot chew it and move it around, Believe it or not, I get a lot of parents that come in here like, yeah, uh, so I ask them, does your kid choke on food a lot? Yeah. Okay, tongue tie. They cannot move the food out of, the, out of the airway. And so they like foods that melt in their mouth. They don't like veggies. They don't, uh, they, they don't mind fruit sometimes, but they don't like this stuff. And so um, that is, those ties can be big. So two things, either uh, you need to have uh, a chiropractor that does cranial sacral work or um and or sometimes the ties i had a uh 13 13 year old yeah 13 year old who um no 11 year old 11 year old she had a tongue tie. she could not stick her tongue out of her mouth hates all sorts of foods uh professional dancer like a sponsored dancer it's crazy but she could also not stand up right because this this tie this this tethering is holding her down and so look there's lots of different things that can go into this stuff the key thing i want you to understand Look, please start identifying where your kid is in the processing world. Because once you can understand their behaviors, it's going to help you as a parent. You're going to understand that, look, they did not punch Jimmy because there's some bad, naughty kid that, you know, or their attitude isn't inherently, you know, they're not bad kids with bad attitudes. They just can't process the world. And then when you come ask them to do something and their, their world is essentially shut down, they're going to go into fight or flight mode. Okay? And so... The moment you can start understanding that, it's going to help you understand your kiddos a little bit better. And ideally, you can start navigating their processing world better, okay? Giving them time to pull in, like the 13-year-old with ADHD, or her sister. I tell the mom, the two opposite kids, I tell mom, the 10-year-old needs to go shoot hoops, okay? She needs to move because that's where she's stuck developmentally. The 13-year-old with ADHD needs to go in a corner and spend 15 minutes reading. And so... Look, you gotta understand this stuff, and once you understand this, you can understand your child, and you can make the correct core, uh, decisions for helping these children. Because this is what I get. I get a lot of parents who have tried dietary stuff, uh, OT, PT, and I'm the last resort, and, and, and no one's talking about the development. Talk development, understand development, and then you can go A, B, C, D. None of my kids change their diet right away, and I'll tell you why. If you're stuck in fight or flight mode, you do not digest food well. You do not process food well. Dietary changes are gonna have a minimal impact until you calm the system. Because what happens with a system that's on fight or flight is the intestinal tract actually opens up and food starts getting into uh, areas that it shouldn't and you see a lot of food allergies, stomach issues, all sorts of stuff, okay? And so you have to start with calming the brain down integrating the primitive reflexes, the motor touch, the auditory, and the visual, calming that autonomic nervous system, boom, you'll see dramatic changes. All right. I guess that's <laughs> All kids are great. Okay. All right, this is, uh, this is the opportunity I'm going to offer to you. I'll, also, I'm going to, um, once we get off, one mom is going to win a free one hour massage for participating on the live. I really appreciate you. So I'm going to go through and randomly pick a name. 
and one of you is going to win a free one-hour massage. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for listening. Thank you for asking questions and participating. I really appreciate it. So um, I will make that announcement in just a few minutes. I need to run home here in a minute because uh, we need to go to a parade birthday wave. So I need to run in just a second. But hey, my offer to you, and this is today. Um, if you message me or raise your hand or say me, whatever, however you want to do it, get a hold of me somehow, okay? You can text me at 972-387-4700. If you text me, um, I will do the full exam on your kiddo. Normally, uh, 197, I'll do it for 97. Um, and I'll give you, I'll tell you where they are, how they're processing the world. I'll give you a plan of care, everything, okay? So if you want to understand your child better, from a physiological standpoint, um, just text me at 972-387-4700 and I'll do that for you. I'm also happy um, if you if you text me today, I will also offer a free uh, teleconference consult too. Okay, so you have two options there. Um, and so just let me know what you want to do, but I am here to help you as parents and to, and to best serve you and your kids and to help you understand your kids and help them function the best way possible. So um, look, my passion is serving you and your families and helping your kiddos and, and, and getting away and moving away from these stereotypical diagnosis and helping your kids function better. That is what I love doing. That's what we focus on in this practice. Um, you know, we're very family oriented. My kids are here most days. It's a little crazy sometimes, uh, you know, when things start opening up more, uh, our kids have been, I haven't been in the office a lot recently, but they will be in again more. Um, it's a lot of fun. A lot of times the kids are playing tag in here and, and having a good time and, and participating. I have little pictures from all my kids or a lot of the kids up on the ceiling. Look, I'm here for you. I want to help. Uh, and so just let me know how I can do that. So text me if that's your, what you're interested in um, for a student. What do you mean for a student? And then also I will announce the winner of that free massage. So um, thank you for being on. I'm sorry that I had to keep checking my phone. I know there was difficulties uh, for some getting in. Um, so I will uh, make the announcement uh, around two o'clock for the winner, but make sure you get a hold of me. I'm here to help you. Any last questions I can answer, I'm gonna answer one or two quick questions and then I have to leave. But again, you are welcome to, to text me uh, and get a free um, tele teleconference uh, video uh, call. Any last questions? I told you a lot. Awesome. I'm glad it was beneficial. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if, if a question does come out, I'll try to answer it uh, afterwards. Yeah, my number is 972-387-4700. Again, um, yeah, teleconference. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's valid for anybody. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. If you have a child, I even have some parents who take me up on it um, for $97. Yeah. And yeah, it's for, for, you, for your family. So some parents bring in, um, we do, a, a, I do, a, um, if you have two kids and you want them both to get exams, uh, it's the same price. So it's $97. So I have some parents, like the one with the, the 13 or 10 year old, started the 13 year old and then a few weeks later um, had her, her 10 year old examined and then I did that for, you know, I, know I don't charge for the second one if, if, if it's scheduled within a couple weeks. So, all right, you're welcome. I'm here to help, so please let me know. If you have questions, you can text me too. Look, you can, don't be afraid to text me. Sometimes there's questions that are more private that you want a text message. You can text me those questions too. So um, I'm here to help. This is about you and your family. So if I can be of service in any way, please let me know. Okay, thank you so much. If I see another question come up, um, I will do my best to answer that. And I'll, I'll put it 972-387-4700. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't comment in this application that I use. Yeah, so 972-387-4700. All right, again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all you do, and I look forward to talking with you. Again, call me, text me if you have questions, and um, you know, I'm here for you.